you know, there are certain times, certain things in your life that impact you greater than others, maybe certain stories. And this story that I'm about to tell you directly impacted my life, and I'll, I'll share how. But my wife is in here, and a lot of my story my wife was not there for. And so I want to be cognizant of that and protect your heart as well. When I was in college, I had a very odd job. That job was that if you died between 6 at night and 8 in the morning, my job was to go pick you up. I know very odd but a lot of the guys at the college were doing it because you worked from six at night till eight in the morning, go to class, and it provided you the ability to go to school full time and only work two to three days a week. One night about three o'clock in the morning, we got a death call. And sometimes we would get 15 to 20 in a night. But on this night about three o'clock in the morning, I believe it was, we got this call and it was a home call which meant a lot of times it was going to be a circus because everybody wanted to say goodbye to grandma, grandpa, or whoever was passing away. But when we got in the hearse, my partner, we had to go in twos to the home. We got in the hearse and I looked at the paper and I saw the name and I didn't read any further. And we went to this affluent part of Jacksonville and when we were driving through the neighborhood, it struck me that there were, no, there were no street lights anywhere, but it was a full moon. And so everything had a blue din to it. And we pulled up in front of this house, and as I said, normally there are a lot of cars there, but there was only one car parked out on the street. And so we pulled up into the driveway and we walked up, there was no light on at the door and we knocked on it and this elderly lady answered and immediately I gathered that we were there to pick up her husband. She let us in the door and it immediately struck me, there were no lights on in the house. And I, I wasn't sure exactly where we were supposed to go and I stood there and she said, I'll be right back. And she walked down the hallway. And as she did, I realized that all of the lights were on in an opposite end of the house. And it was so bright down there, it contrasted with the darkness of where we were standing. But then when I looked to my right, I could see the moon had shined in through the, the light or through the glass of the windows and everything, you could see the outlines of it. And over to my left, there was a staircase. And I saw these two figures coming, walking down the hallway. A young couple, 30, 30-ish years old. And they looked like Ken and Barbie. They were just this beautiful couple. And I looked back down at the paper, and I realized I was there to pick up their son. Eight years old. It was really hard picking up children. And they said, follow, follow us. And so we walked down the hallway, and as we did, we walked into the light, and every light was on in the house in this area, and things just kind of didn't make sense because as you got into the room, off to the right over here, there was this big TV playing Cartoon Network, and you could hear all of the sounds of cartoons, and then you could hear, still hear the medical equipment as the nurse was trying to shut everything down. And I looked over, and I saw this little boy as my eyes were still adjusting, and he was so deformed, I had never seen anything like it. And I looked down at him, and his head had fallen off the pillow. And immediately I looked down, and I saw that his head was so narrow. I had never seen anything like it, and very elongated. And his eyes were almost fish-looking, and they, the eyelids wouldn't shut down over his eyes. And he just stared blankly off in death, and I sat there... And I, I looked at him and almost recoiled and I looked up and I'm crying already and I look up and I see this mom and this dad and they're crying. I look over and I see my partner who's standing there and you have to understand JD is this six foot something guy 
he's this hard redneck that hung out with the Leonard Skinner guys down in Jacksonville, and he's crying. And I later, as I looked into the eyes of this mom and dad, I later realized it was almost this thought of, please don't recoil or please don't reject my son. It's, his teeth were almost sideways in his head. His jaw was so deformed. And his tongue was dried out from years of having to suction his mouth out because he could not swallow. And I looked up at the dad and I said, sir, I said, can, can I take your son? And I pulled the, the stretcher up next to the bed and adjusted it to the right height. And the dad just nodded his head and said, okay, go ahead. And I started to put my hands up underneath this boy. And all of a sudden, this, I felt this hand on my arm. It was the dad. And he said, wait a minute, can, can I do that? And I said, okay. This little boy had died hard. He was sweaty. His body had released into his diaper. He was, the smells, death has a distinct smell to it. And this dad, no gloves on. He didn't care what his son would look like. He didn't care what was all over him. He reached up underneath him and he picked him up and he put him on that stretcher. And I remember when he put him on that stretcher, he pulled his arms out from underneath it. And I can still, I can still remember seeing the, the fecal matter in that on his arms. I mean, I literally could. And he didn't even care. And he wiped that little boy's face off. And he kissed him. And I heard him under his breath say, son, I love you. <laughs> And I realized in that moment what it was to be a father. To love unconditionally to, no matter what happened, that's my son. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, that is exactly what you were. You were deformed in sin and you were broken and twisted and God picked you up through the blood of Jesus Christ. And he wiped you off and he kissed you and said, I love you. The reason that story matters is because I had no idea that some years later, I would be that very father. My third child was born, her name was Madison. And she was born missing her left eye and parts of her brain. And now all of a sudden, my mind raced back to that story, to that event, to that thing that impacted my life so hard, and I realized that I'm them. I'm them. See, what you don't know when you see me because it's easy to judge the book by its cover and by rights when you see me, it's easy to read the book. I was obsessed with bodybuilding before I could even write. I grew up in it. And I'm not talking about going to the gym. I'm talking about in my 20s, I was the next guy coming out. And I got saved and I quit. I went to Bible college and seminary and I was 20 years into the ministry at this point. By everybody's account, I was successful because I was now pastoring in a mega church and making a six-figure salary all the way back then. And, and I had stopped and gone to a, another city to plant a church, and now this, this Category 5 hurricane had just settled over our life. And, and for two years and two weeks, I would fight for Madison's life times in the McDonald, Ronald McDonald house, my house was now an ICU room just like those people's house. My daughter could not swallow. On a good day, a couple of hundred seizures. 
on a bad day, thousands. I know because I sat in the hospital in an epilepsy ward and every time she had a seizure, she was hooked up to all these wires. I had to mark the tape from the camera up here, press the button, mark the tape, and then write down what she did. I wrote down 996 seizures and they cut it off at six hours because they said I had caught less than half. Her brain was seizing constantly. Strokes, seizures, comas. Somehow she lived to two years and two weeks. I couldn't get help from, this, from the state of Florida. They enacted the Feudal Care Act on me, on, on our daughter, and they cut us off from insurance because if you're fit, if they can get a doctor to say your care is futile, then they will cut you off. And the goal is so that you will commit your child to the state and they will starve her and, and they will dehydrate her to death. They did it to Terry Schiavo. But I, I couldn't do that. I could not allow them to just take my daughter's life. That was God's to do, not mine. I did not, God gave her life and it was God's to take when it was her time. I stood in front of ethics committees and in all kinds of things, constantly fighting for her. And one day, I was there taking care of her by myself and she started to have a seizure that I could not stop. And I gave her the emergency meds and she started making this clicking noise. I'd never heard it before. And I never got to hear her voice. That was the thing. You know, as a dad, what is the greatest thing when you come home and your kids are so little, you open that door and the first thing you hear is, Daddy! <laughs> and the kids come and they jump on you and all that. I never got to hear her voice except for when she would seize. And I would hear that. She had such a sweet tone and I would hear her involuntarily cry out. But I never got to hear her call me daddy. And I know she's in heaven. And I know one day, I'm, I'm going to hear that voice. I want to see Jesus. But man, it's going to be heaven when I can hear my little girl say daddy just once. That will be amazing for me. Madison, I called the doctor. Her oxygen sats were plummeting. I called the doctor, and our doctor came to us because we, to take Madison anywhere meant a life flight, and it, it was critical. And he came, and he put the Ambu bag on her. He's trying to keep her alive. And I leaned down, and I whispered in her ear. I said, Madison, your mommy's not here. You've got to hold on. And somehow, her oxygen sats came up, and in the next morning, she passed away in my arms. And I remember putting my daughter on the stretcher, just like that man did. Instead of running to God, instead of running to grace, I became Jonah, and I ran from God. And I pulled a Peter when he denied Christ, and the next thing you see with Peter basically is he's like, I'm going fishing. I'm going back to my old life. And so I went back to bodybuilding, and this time, not out of insecurity as a little kid who had all of these deformities when I was born, because I had so many surgeries to fix things that were wrong. Now I did it out of rebellion. I was angry. I was bitter. I was broken. We had no money. And I ran from God. I preached her funeral, and I checked out a pastor. I went to my elders and I said, I'm done. 
I can't help anybody else. I can't help me. I moved out of the town, then I moved out of the state, pursuing bodybuilding the entire time, which is what I came from. Blew up 300 plus pounds, became a pro. I met my wife, Sandra, who was competing also at the time. And I dragged her and her four girls into my boat, into my rebellion. And I would imagine through the years there were many times where she probably would have wished there was somebody that would have said, don't go with that guy. Because there is nothing worse than a man who knows to do good and knows what he should be doing when he's running from God. Because you see, now she was involved in my storm. She was involved in my discipline. She was involved in everything that God was doing to discipline me. Now she is having to go through this. And, and she had no idea the depth of where I had fallen 2019, God had cornered me, boxed me in. We would try to go to church, but we couldn't sustain it. She'll tell you. She was the one who would try to push, hey, let's go to church. And I couldn't, I couldn't. I would make every excuse. But when we would go, as soon as the worship would start and the lights would go down, the Holy Spirit would start speaking to me and start convicting me. And when you're this big, everybody looks at you like a freak anyway, so they're all staring at you in church. What's that guy doing in here? And then when you start to sob uncontrollably, everybody's looking at you. What is wrong with him? <laughs> but I was under so much conviction. And finally, 2019... We went to a service, and I can still remember standing there, and the lights went down. The worship started just like today. And just like every time worship starts in here, I still do the same thing, only this time not out of rebellion, but out of gratefulness. I still, if you, <laughs> don't look at me, please. But during worship, I have tears running down my face, but that day, God, like I said, had cornered me. He had pursued me. He was disciplining me through those 15 years, even to the point where I was in a car accident and paralyzed on my left side for almost two years. And the doctor said, you're going to be on a walk or forget it. And I was like, no, 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 no. I doubled down, did my own rehab, started getting feeling back in my hands and my limbs. And that day, I was back in the gym two years later almost because I had taken the idea of a boxer. If I can stick and move spiritually, I don't have to make any decisions for God. I can stay hard. I can stay cold. I can stay not feeling. We were standing in church. Lights go down, and immediately the Holy Spirit started speaking to my heart. And like any Sunday we went, I started to try to control my sobbing, my breathing, and I started doing like I did every Sunday that we went. I would start planning my exit. How do I get out of here if I start getting out of control? And that day, I don't know who was at church. I don't even know what they were preaching about. But I simply had my eyes closed, and I said, God, I repent. <sighs> can't go any further. I couldn't, couldn't compete anymore. I tore my lat. God had just made it to where it was him and me. You're not, you're, you're, you're boxed in. It's just you and me now. What are you going to do? And I had made my wife miserable. We were on the verge of divorce. And by rights, she should have left me, but she showed me grace when I didn't deserve it. 
And I remember I prayed and I said, God, I repent. I don't even know where you are anymore. I had been wandering in a desert for so long. I didn't know where God was. I didn't know where I was. And the one thing I know about a spiritual desert is it's hot, it's dry, it's barren, and your voice is the only voice you hear. And all of a sudden, for the third time in my life, and I know it was the voice of God, not audible, but so distinct in my spirit, I actually wrote it down. It's in my phone, in my notes. I wrote it down. It impacted me. And the three times that I know God spoke to me, I know it was God because it produced fruit in my life. Things changed in my life. And I repented and I said, God, I can't, I can't go any further. I'm loaded out on more drugs than you can possibly imagine. If you know anybody that's in the bodybuilding lifestyle, you haven't talked to me. It's a wicked, debased life. You don't want to go there. I repented, and I said, God, please, I just need help. And the Lord told me three things, and I have them in my phone. They were so distinct. God said, Jeff, I've heard your prayer. You were healed. I had never mourned the death of my daughter. I just ran. And then the Holy Spirit said, your wandering is over. All of a sudden, this weight physically came off of me. And I mean physically. And I remember sitting down through the service, and I was so arrested in my soul. I didn't, I, I, I didn't hear anything. I was just wrestling with what I had heard from God in praying through that. And I took my wife in the girl's home, and I said, hey, I'm going to run to the store real quick. And I called the greatest Christian I knew, and that was my mother, who had been praying for me forever. <laughs> and I mean forever. And I told her what happened, and she said, that's the Lord. I used to want to do great things for God. I really did. When I was a young preacher boy, I heard a pastor talking in a sermon on brokenness and how God uses broken people and broken things. And I romanticized it in my head. And I remember praying, God, break, break me. I want to be a broken servant. You see, my idea of brokenness was that I would get up. And you have to understand, there were days I was speaking to thousands, I mean, First Baptist in Naples, thousands of people. And I was an unbroken, an unbroken servant. And I remember now that I thought what I thought brokenness was. Be careful what you pray for. Because I would go into the woods and I would fast and I would pray and I would ask God, God, break me, use me. I had no idea that brokenness is a process. And God breaks and God ships away deeper and deeper until there's nothing more of me left, nothing more of you left. Just the image of Christ. And I can, to this day, I look and I thought, God, the one thing I know about brokenness is you don't choose the tools God uses to break you. You don't choose the size of the hammers that he hits with. And you don't choose the duration 
of how long it takes. I look back at my life and I've dealt with so much guilt and shame for so long that here I was a pastor and now I'm a freak running from God. And like we were talking about the other day, the Bible says Jesus was the lamb slain from the foundation of the earth. God saw my life all the way back then. And he knew I would fail and he knew I would deny him. He knew all of it. <laughs> and he still loves me. I was the prodigal. I was the man of God who got in the boat and said, God, no. But God is gracious. You say, what do you want to do for God? I don't want to do anything for God. I want God to do something through me. I teach a men's group here on Wednesday night, and I love it. And I have a wonderful wife that some reason stayed with me, and I'm blessed. Thankfully, we're out of that life, and now we try to reach back into that world. We've asked God to redeem that because so many of those guys are dying and dead that I, wor that I competed with. And so we try to reach into that world and win them to Christ now.